All right. Well, let's uh, let's get started here. We're a, we're a touch after uh, touch after seven thirty, and uh, we have a great group already. So if more people come in, that'll be good. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming here. Uh, my name is Alex Barrett. I'm a consulting forester uh, from Longview Forest, uh, up just across the border here in Vermont. Um, and Mary Wigmore will introduce herself in a second. But uh, tonight's workshop is going to be um, hopefully a, a pretty lively uh, exchange of ideas and uh, dialogue between everybody and us. Um, and we'll get right into some details here if I can uh, make sure that my screen sharing. Can everybody see that second slide all right? Yes. Perfect. Um, so this is kind of a general outline of what we're going to hope to cover tonight. Um, we're going to do some very quick introductions uh, for Mary and I, um, and then we're going to talk about our process and you know how the grant that is funding this work uh, is structured and how we've attempted to sort of attack the, the set of tasks before us. Um, we'll take a, a deep dive into the forests through a series of pictures with some comments um, and different ideas. Um, we'll get into the survey results. Um, I checked just before and we have almost, we had 78 people uh, who filled out the survey, which is, uh, you know, applause. Like I, I it's totally amazing. Um, we didn't know if we were going to get 20 people or 50 and instead we got 80. So thank you. Like you guys are showing up and it's really wonderful. Um, we're going to weave some education throughout the whole thing, uh, building on some of the things that you all read in the survey. Um, and then we're going to have some small working groups that, you know, it's looking like we're going to have a really good size for uh, some smaller, a little bit more intimate discussions and then some reporting back to the group. Um, thank you guys for bearing with us in some, some crazy times. We, we hope to be walking out in the woods doing this and pointing at trees and, and touching things together, but instead we're stuck doing this in offices. So thank you for bearing with. Hopefully it will go well. Um, Mary's going to kind of lead the meeting. I'll be facilitating and speaking a little bit as well um, and trying to make sure that I run the Zoom here okay. Um, I am recording this all so that if anybody blips out or something happens to the wires, then this will be available to everybody afterward. Um, so we're into introductions. We're going to then talk about the project. Um, we're going to have some question and answer sessions in about 25 minutes from now. Um, we're going to use the chat function for the questions and answers because having a lot of people chime in at the same time doesn't work particularly well on Zoom. Um, so there, I have a little circle here on this. You can see if you go to your little taskbar there, uh, there's a chat function um, there that you can type in questions and we'll, we'll bring those to the group and just, you know, you can email, you can text to anybody in the group or you can text to the group. So just please be aware of, of who you're talking with. Um, and um, then we'll have some breakout sessions uh, where we have some questions for you all to work on uh, and hopefully build on what we're doing tonight. Then we'll come back, wrap it up, um, and then, you know, if there are spillover questions at the end, we can continue to, to take them here. Um, and yeah, the whole point is that we want to hear what you all are thinking and, and hopefully begin to develop a coherent set of ideas and plans moving forward. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mary at this point. Okay. Um, well, we've been bombarding you with information, so apologize for that. The, the, project, the project that we're involved with is sponsored by the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs out of Boston. They formed a, a partnership with three Western Mass entities, um, Franklin Regional Council of Governments, the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, and Franklin Land Trust. And they formed this partnership to promote the use of the forest resource base in, West, in 21 municipalities west of the Connecticut River. Conway's one of them. You're, the pilot, you're one of the pilot projects. And the thinking behind the grant, um, we put their website there, you can visit there to get more information about this project. But their thinking behind the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership is figuring out how to perhaps boost the economies of these Western Mass these 21 Western Mass towns by using the forests for recreational, um, what, is, what do they call it? 
a recreational economy or, you know, people coming to visit and hike and this is spending money in the county, in the two counties, Berkshire and Franklin. And so this was created and dreamed up down in Boston. And these Western Mass agencies are the facilitators. They are the ones who worked with your towns to apply for a grant. So we could go to the next slide, please, Alex. And, oh, who we are. So I'm Mary Wigmore. I live in Asheville, Mass. Um, I, I was really interested in the educational piece and the community outreach piece of this project. And I am a licensed forester in Massachusetts. So I've been helping with the, the management plan and inventory piece also. I've worked the Hilltowns for 40 years. One of my first forestry jobs was in Conway on the Warner property. God, that was, I was still a student at UMass. <laughs> but um, I made a living in the woods. I, I love being in the forest. And when the project came up, I knew I couldn't do it alone. So I reached out to Longview Forest out of Southern Vermont. You've met Alex. And he was willing to collaborate with me on this project. So the next slide goes into a little bit about the project. And how we got involved is the Franklin Regional Council of Governments was working with your board of selectmen. Your board, your select board voted yes to participate in the Mohawk Trails Woodlands Partnership. And then in order to start launching the, the partnership, this project was, um, your town worked with FERCOD to apply to the Massachusetts Executive, uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to get some funding to start exploring your forest base that is community owned. So it was a bidding process. We submitted a proposal. Our bid was um, selected for the award of the project. And all of that information is accessible. It's, it's public knowledge. You could get it from FERCOG. Um, people have requested it and they send you to a website. And there were two main goals of this, this specific project. One was to educate your community, your town, about what sustainable forestry practices are, what they might look like, how you might use them. And the second part of the project was to inventory your forest, the town owned forest lands, and complete forest stewardship management plans for those two town forests in your, in your property, the 40-year property and the old town farm property. And we have no other economic interest in this outside of this grant that was awarded to our to our collaboration. We love the woods. We do make our living in an industry that harvests forest products. So full disclosure, but we left that agenda at the door because if you move into the next slide, we thought about how to do this project and serve the mandate that your select board and the FERCOG had stated, it was very clear in the grant, that we were to reach out to community, try to understand what your town, what the residents in your town who own these forests hold as a vision for their future use, their future condition. And, and then to complete the management plans. Our thinking was that these, process, these two goals had to be somehow molded together. They had to be woven intimately where we've done, we met with your select board, where we did that survey as a component of the outreach. We're having the online workshop. We're, we're planning to have another one. We've done the postcards. And then the other, weaving them together simultaneously, we've been visiting the forest, conducting the forest inventory, making maps of the ecosystem, collecting scientific data. And that's what we do as professional foresters. That's what we're skilled to do. The integration component, the part that we see as really important is to take your vision, your interest in your values and integrate it with what is the condition and the quality of your force right now. And then to produce the force stewardship management plan. And another part of the whole, it's like a, to me, it's just this full circle is the force themselves. They are beautiful, healthy, resilient forest and they're sort of the, the heart of the project. And we're hoping that your input makes the soul of the project. That's a little bit about our process, how we got here tonight. So we're ready to move on. And I wanna give just a really brief summary of the two properties. Alex will expound further. He's, got, he's gonna go over the science and some photographs, images of the woods. So 
I visited both of the properties recently. I worked on one of them, the Old Town Forest down in 2009. Both of these properties did have um, timber harvesting done in the past. Um, sustainable forestry, timber harvesting is a sustainable forestry practice. It's silviculture. Silviculture is the art and science of tending to your forest, to your, to your, the trees that are on the site. So um, the timber harvest wasn't the sole reason to be out there. The projects that were done in the past down your woods, the select board at that time had initiated, had also gone out to bid on these projects. I was selected for one. Bay State Forestry Services was selected for the Fournier project. So they managed that harvest. And the civil cultural goals that were set on both those properties, um, one, the Old Todd Farm had, had suffered pretty dramatic ice damage from the 2008 ice storm that we had in West County. And so some of the red pines were severely damaged. Their tops were broken off. Um, insects and pests were getting into them. So the, the civil cultural goal of going in was to salvage that wood and then to strive to introduce the seedlings and a young age class, a new age class, all through the, the rest of the forest, the mixed white pine groves, um, oak hardwood groves, red oak and, hard, and other associated hardwood groves. And the goal, the civil cultural goal at Fournier was also the introduction of a new age class. They used, at Old Town Farm, we used what's called the selection harvest system, where you go in and you select a, a single individual tree or groups of three to four trees. In the red pine, the groups were rather large. We took out all of the red pine. At the Fournier property, the Shelterwood Harvest went in and made patches, openings in the woods in order to have these openings fill with new seedlings. So um, to reiterate our, in our education on, I'm gonna call them SFP, Sustainable Forestry Practices. We use those in the past um, timber harvest work on those lands. And that's just a little piece of the story. Alex is gonna go into some images and sort of more detail. I'm going to interject as we go along because I think when I read the survey, sometimes people confuse timber harvesting is one sustainable forestry practice. And it's used through the tool of silviculture to manipulate and manage the, the timber on the site. But there's a whole host of other SFPs that were used in these projects and well, and We'll see. Okay, Alex, you can take away. All right, unmuted. Um, good, so you didn't get to hear my bumble out of the gate. Um, so this is a map of the, uh, the Old Town Farm. Um, as many of you have, you know, come up Cricket Hill, walked through the heart of the property, been by the amazing cemetery there, and then uh, headed out to this gorgeous wetland, which popped up in most of the surveys of people who had been to this property, basically said, that's an amazing spot and we'll, we'll get to there in a second. Um, but this is a map that we begin to develop. Um, it's based on maps that the town has had in the past. And then, you know, I have at this point spent many hours gridding back and forth across this whole property, looking at trees and wildlife sign. And, uh, you know, right here we have this amazing tree that a bear has been marking up for, or probably a couple different bears have been marking up for a while. Um, they tend to develop really cool roots through the forest. So we're beginning to develop a really cool appreciation of all the stuff that's going on out there. Um, here, this is in the, the sort of back south uh, west corner of the property. I'm going to have five different sort of photos that try to capture a lot of what's going on on this forest. Um, here, these small trees kind of in this, this little hole in the forest were created during that harvest uh, that Mary helped oversee um, back in uh, 2009 and 10. Um, so I guess my math is off by one year. Um, but, you know, here, th these are the trees of the future. Um, it's, it's very neat. They've actually established, they're growing. And if you kind of look around here, you know, this is a 24 inch monster oak tree, big pine trees. So the thing that really jumps out to me here when I think about this forest is it's the diversity of things that are going on here. Um, you know, Mary, retained these, you know, this dead material that's standing. Um, if you've ever felled trees in the forest to keep these standing, you have to be careful to not knock them over. So that's a very careful practice that was happening during the logging time. And then there's all this material on the ground. 
was intentionally left. Um, we don't really encourage the vacuuming of the forest. Uh, this, this stuff is really important. Um, it's the mycelial gardens in the forest. It's the decaying matter. It's where a lot of creatures that are at the bottom of the food chain are poking around and doing their thing. Um, and so here, you know, we have from six inches up to uh, 110 foot tall pine trees, you know, there are layers and different creatures are using these different layers. But also this is a forest that, you know, when this tree blows over and it, it eventually will, um, you know, these trees are just waiting there ready to grow. Uh, and they're already kind of doing their thing. So it's a pretty exciting little, little part. This is the back corner. We'll get into some of the different areas uh, in a second. Do you want to add anything there, Mary? Um, no, I'll, I'll start with the next slide. All right. <laughs> um, I'm sure that this is a very familiar image to, to a lot of folks. This is, uh, this is the beaver meadow, which is one of the more spectacular ones that I know of in within 200 miles of where I live. Um, so this is the beaver meadow on kind of the northern part of the property. Um, it is just a, a mecca of birding uh, and bird life. It's a very dynamic place. Um, water levels are going up and down. You can see that there's a beaver lodge right here. There's fresh activity everywhere. There are little beaver slides shooting off into the woods. Um, this is a place that a lot of people come specifically to look at birds. Um, this is a place, you know, you might hear a bittern uh, this time of year. Um, or, you know, when I was there, it was like tree swallow feeding time over here. Um, one thing that's also, you know, key to think about here, if you kind of think back to where we were with the, some little pine trees, you know, this is an unbelievable patch of old field pine that has grown up in a, a plowed field surrounded by stone walls. Um, this pine forest here is relatively vulnerable, and that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just, you know, this area doesn't particularly have a set of young trees there ready to grow. So, you know, if we had a big windstorm, this is an area that would take a while to kind of recover to something that looks like this forest. Um, so that's just one thing to think there. The other important thing that I noted walking around here is there are exotic invasive plants that are sort of colonizing the shorelines here. And you often find that in wetlands. Um, the birds are wonderful, but they also tend to spread both good and bad plants. So that's something to think about here. A lot of people in the survey were very keen on restoring ecological balance and resilience and a, and a process there that often needs to happen is, is dealing with the invasive plants in some way or another. And when I see this photo, this Mary again, um, I remember in your select board at the time had guidelines and they wanted to protect um, valuable habitat inclusions or niches. And that white pine on the other side, we purposely did not enter that. That was one of our sustainable forestry practices. It was codified in the harvest cutting plan. The trees were left to provide cover, a dense forest grove adjacent to a water source. And one that you might use in the future would be the control of the invasive plants that are mixed in this ecosystem now. Thanks, Alex. So out in the the what used to be a red pine plantation, which was you know something that you know some people in Conway had had planted a long time, you know, eighty years ago. Um, when Mary was talking about the the ice storm damage and the insects, um, you know, this is an area that was very you know aggressively harvested in a very purposeful way, but it it was it was very substantial change here. You know, we left you know some big tall legacy white pine that are just they're forever trees; they just stay there. Um, the flush of regeneration here is pretty outstanding. Uh, this is 25 foot tall hardwood. There are eight to 10 different species ranging from, you know, pin cherries, which jump out in these kind of scenarios, to red maple, to oak, to the different birches. Um, this little patch is, uh, I, I took this picture because I was trying to see a black, uh, a black throated blue warbler that was like foraging along the edge of it. But, you know, they, they're generally not a shrubby kind of species, but they, they like to stop here during migration. So, you know, this young forest here is regenerating. It's the, these are again, trees of the future. This is a little bit more dramatic than the first picture, um, but this, this early successional habitat sort of young forest is something that, you know, in the thirties, Massachusetts was, had a lot of this habitat. Um, we don't really anymore. Uh, that has shifted the suite of species that are using our forests. Out here, um, 
I, you know, I took a picture of baby woodcock that we found and like ruffed grouse were all over the place. Like this is the young forest where those creatures are enjoying themselves. Um, deeper into the woods where the, the selection harvest was happening, um, you know, here's a recent blowdown that happened in the forest. So this is a monster old red maple tree um, surrounded by, you know, retained in the harvest, surrounded by a bunch of small trees that have grown up since. This damage has happened in the last couple of years and is actually a wonderful thing. Like this is big enough that this is where creatures make dens, things live. And then this, uh, this red maple here, um, you know, right now, this is where bats are beginning to think about hanging out with their, you know, this is a northern long-eared bat habitat kind of thing um, and is a, is a very special feature in this forest. Um, and the harvest also retained um, these clumps of hemlock that is a really nice, you know, they're, they're there mainly for wildlife and to add structure. They're not there uh, for any kind of real human focus. Um, so that, that's another really neat feature out there right now. And I might add, with, the, with this photo, this is a good one, because if one of your goals in caring for these forests as you move into the future is to improve songbird habitat, when we retain coarse woody material on the forest floor, it breaks down, contributes to the substrate for invertebrates to use within the upper soil layers, and songbirds can feed on them and other small mammals. So that's an example of a practice, a tool that you can use Sometimes in timber harvest, we recommend they leave it. Other people go in and selectively just drop trees to increase coarse woody material. But that's a practice that you could use to achieve your goals. Thank you. Yep. So when I was when I was out there measuring in this area, you know, I note the the quality and size of the material. And the the good news out here is that there's lots of it. Um, in certain forests, there's not, and so we might suggest creating it. In this case, that doesn't need to be done because nature is clearly doing it very nicely. Um, and then our last slide from the Old Town Farm. Um, this is obviously an amazing historical feature. Um, you know, beautiful stone walls, one of the most amazing, well-laid, you know, dry stone laid foundations out there. It's just amazing. And then obviously the cemetery um, where Malachi Maynard is buried. Um, and if you've read the, you know, the, the history of Conway. Um, it has some great lines in there about Malachi Maynard showing up with like a bag of fish and uh, a couple pigs to some farm. Um, and I had no idea who he was uh, until uh, the select board notified me. And uh, I've now read up on him a little bit. And what an amazing dude uh, to be, I think, pretty proud of. So there's really special just human historical value. Um, also important just to know that, you know, he was a farmer and this was a farm, I mean, this was all cleared uh, in you know, the late 1700s when he, was, when he was here and early 1800s. So you know, we're dealing with a, with a legacy forest here that's been you know, managed in one way or another for you know, over 230 years at this point. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so I will try to be succinct. But moving, moving you know, out of the uh, hills of the hill towns down to behind the grammar school, um, this is the slightly more sort of urban, urban forest, uh, if you will, um, but an amazing place. These, these little uh, froggy creatures here are, uh, are symbols for vernal pools. This property is uh, rich with them and it has a very high density of them um, and has a beautiful trail that goes by them, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, you know, this place also saw a set of, you know, uh, harvesting practices um, that were done, uh, in this case, 12 years ago. Um, most of the logging roads are very hard to find because they're filled with little tiny trees. Um, but this central kind of arterial road um, was seeded, put to bed very nicely. Just it was smooth. The water bars were installed. Um, and it leads you right along this little necklace of beautiful vernal pools right through the middle of the property. Um, so the trail itself is an amazing asset. I know that the kids at the school use it a fair bit. Um, I found uh, you know, a fair number of little frog nets that people had left in various places. So hopefully the children are treating the pools well. Um, but there are some invasive plants in here um, taking advantage of the sunlight. Um, so they're also something to keep, keep an eye on at this forest. And, and you would expect that down here kind of where um, 
the forest is a little bit more perforated by, by human development. And when I know the trails here, if you uh, real quick, Alex, is a part of the harvest that was conducted by Bay State Forestry, when the harvesting was done, they went in, graded the trails and seeded them. And that's a practice that you can do. It protects your soil from erosion. It protects the soil structure and in integrity. If, you're con if one of your goals was to use the, the forest as a carbon pool, a carbon sink, half your carbon in the forest is in the soil. So you want to leave the site with well, with stable, protected soil. And that practice of seeding in the roads after use, it, it, that's what it is, sustainable forest practice. Thanks. Um, similarly to the Old Town Farm, you know, this property also has quite the historical legacy uh, in terms of stone walls. And then this is the, the ice pond that's sort of in the southern part of the property. Um, it's fulfilling a lot of similar functions. You know, it's not a vernal pool, but uh, it has a lot of amphibian life. Um, and when I come into an area like this, I, I tend to think about it as a potential sort of like long-term reserve area. It's, it's hard to tell, but this white pine is like, you know, three feet in diameter. It's a monster tree. It's really beautiful. Um, it has some steep hillsides behind it that have oak and maple and ash on them. Um, and as we, you know, something that we heard loud and clear in the survey that we'll get into is that having some representative areas that are simply untouched here um, and just leave them as reserves is, uh, is a really cool practice. And it's something that can be done very purposefully um, and you know, put on a map and maintained over generations. And those will, areas like this will develop into really neat long-term features on the property. Um, almost done with the, with, the, with the grammar school for now, um, but we were talking about disturbance and resilience. Um, we're gonna get into the tornado a little bit later, um, but this, this slide attempts to illustrate um, kind of how overlapping timeframes kind of bump into each other by random here. <laughs> so on the right-hand side, here's some tornado damage. So this is a big hemlock tree that blew over in that tornado. Um, the town went through and, and you know, cleaned up the trails so the people could walk on them, but left the wood in the forest, which is great. Um, over here, you have some of the same kind of material that was created not by nature, but in this case, by logging. Um, you know, much older, you know, 10, 12 years older, this is decaying at a newer rate. So you have all these, you know, pieces of wood in the woods that are deteriorating uh, over time. And at the same time, you know, the harvest from 2008 created the opportunity for all these small trees to get started. When the tornado came, um, you know, it did damage, but there was already a 30 foot high forest there that, you know, these little trees don't really care particularly about the tornado. Um, and so they're incredibly resilient in that kind of disturbance. Um, however, in an ice storm, they're incredibly not resilient because they will bend over. Um, so, you know, resilience is something we'll talk about a little bit tonight. Um, but, you know, in this case, the forest man, you know, the sustainable forest management practices from a decade prior, um, accelerated the resilience here. Whether that's important or not is, you know, that's to be discussed, but that's just something to note here. Um, the vernal pools, uh, we'll continue to talk about. Um, you can see uh, a scientist here, or uh, county forester rather, uh, service forester looking into the vernal pool, but this is a really cool one in the back of the property. Um, quite a few special plants and also some rare ones nearby. Um, you wouldn't really know this is there unless you walked 20 feet up a hill off the trail and poked your head over the lip and saw it. So, you know, maybe that's good or maybe a, a sign and a small trail um, would be a nice way to kind of access this in a really long-term responsible way to not damage it. Um, and then lastly, um, Mary, do you want to take this slide and talk about the, the, the pine here? Oh, so that is an example of silviculture. The practice there was the shelterwood harvest system. Its goal was to regenerate white pine, which it did very well. You can see at the base of the foot, the image, all of those young seedling trees, they're under six feet. Well, they're about 10, 11 years old. And the practice they did was the implementation of the shelterwood harvest. And the goal was to introduce new seedling class, which was successful. I think we can move on to the survey issues. Awesome. 
And so, um, I mean, well, let's, should we, I, should we, should we pause for a couple of questions if we have them? Sure. That's a good plan. So if anybody has any questions, they could type them into the chat function or we can also kind of accumulate them as we go along if, if nobody has them. Craig, Craig, thanks for letting me know about the, the snowmobile trail, a snowmobile club doing a fair bit of the maintenance there, which is really good to know. I didn't, I didn't know that. Good. Um, cool. We'll, we'll have plenty of time for other questions. Oh, okay. Um, can you compare your practice to what happened south of the beaver pond, which was, which post logging was impassable? Um, okay, understood. So on the, ta on the, um, on the grammar school here, um, the practice, the logging practices had that, that central road that was intentionally cleft clear. And I now understand largely because, uh, it is used by the school, but also because of the snowmobile club, uh, which hi obviously highly values it. Um, whereas the harvest in the red pine, south of the beaver pond on the old town farm forest, so different forest, similar uh, disturbances, um, that area, which was a red pine plantation, um, a person is saying how that was really not, you weren't really able to walk through that when it was done. Um, and that's something that, you know, different logging systems and different practices result in different conditions in the forest. Um, and, you know, many people experience forests by the trails that are on them, but also a lot of people will, you know, walk across lots across forests and are used to doing that. It's really important, you know, if you do a timber harvest to make sure that people understand uh, that it's coming uh, and that we can, you know, try to mitigate, you know, how it impacts different people's uses of that forest. Um, so, you know, one person is experiencing it as impassable and like, you know, that's totally valid and, and real. Um, you know, the town also went in and, you know, did clean up after the tornado because it was impassable and, you know, spent money to do that. So I guess different practices are going to impact different people's uses in different ways. Um, so I guess that's the comparison and hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. And, uh um, as Megan Gump asked the question, you might want to get back to me and maybe email me. I'm going to go out to that site this weekend and I'll, I'll look at that. I was involved with that project, but don't have a clear rem memory of where you're speaking of, but I think I know. So I, I will follow up with you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And it'd be, it's interesting because you're talking about, uh, this area. Um, yeah, totally agree. Mary McClintock. Um, <laughs> But, you know, here where it was impassable, it's now, you know, 10 years later, uh, you can walk very easily through here. It's a very different uh, feel because it's a, it's a very young forest, but you can actually walk through this brushy area really easily now. Um, oh, I see, okay. Um, and yes, Janet, the, we'll, we'll get into the survey in a second, but if we were gonna have a winner, it would be trails. Um, all right, well, let's hop into, into survey here, Mary. Okay. My screen is weirding out, but if you proceed through the slides, I might be able to catch up with you. So the goal of the survey was, we believe that we couldn't write a plan for your town without hearing what the community felt, loved, valued in these two town forests. So a the introductory questions in the survey, we're really just trying to pull out of you what you do when you go there. And a major response was recreate. You go there to bike, to walk, to walk your dogs, to and just enjoy how beautiful it is there, just to listen to the silence of nature. And what I took away from those introductory questions is you really love your town forest. And one of your most fundamental reasons and values is the recreational value it offers, be it active in the biking, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, or passive and just botanizing, enjoying being out there. So we could go to the next slide. These first three slides are just your own comments. We're just trying to mirror them back. Uh, many people, when they were asked, what comes to mind when you think of the forest? It, it was the same. I, I took from it, I interpreted 
the great value you place on these treasures that you have so close to home. Um, there were a lot of comments on that it was over log, that the, the trails were disturbed with the timber harvesting. There were comments about recognizing what a treasure it is, what a precious asset that you own. Um, people enjoy the historical place. I think people use words like magical, wonderful. And so we got a sense of what we we're coming into with writing the plans is trying to um, assimilate that love, that, that concern, that deep connection that you have emotionally to your forest. We can go to the next slide, Alex. Um, it's just amazing, like, you know, 80 people, like, you know, a huge response to that mailing, you know, and each one of you put some kind of thing like this. So it was just, it was a real joy to read. And we should also note, Mary, that, you know, all the survey results, we'll be making them all public and publishing yes. them around so you can all read them. Um, but they're, they're a pretty cool testament to all the forests here. Yeah, I'm having, trying to, Somehow I got shut out of the Zoom, Alex, so I'm trying to get back in, so I'm trying the password again. But um, yeah, that other one, I'm assuming you're looking at the slide that says about what you love about the forest, and that was pretty, I like that too. That was pretty amazing. Again, those are just your words, reiterating your, what you told us about the, some of the special places that you like to go to when you're on the town forest and Alex is fixing my technology issue. Thank you. <laughs> so we could move on in the, the slideshow. I was, I was impressed by how well you knew it. Uh, people know where these things are. It sounds like they go often to treasure them and hold them dear. Yeah, that was, I like that. And then we had a couple of questions that we have to write this forest stewardship management plan. And in the plan, you try to um, articulate what the community, the owners of the forest, which is the community, the town of Conway owns these forests, and you try to articulate the values that people feel are important. If they were gonna go in and do activities, trail building, adding signs, invasive control, what values would be driving those activities? And what we found very, um, we had that, continuum of very important, important, not important. And all of these eight came up as really important to your community that you, the reasons you may want to go on and do some active caring or storing of these woods are to sustain your biodiversity, to protect the aesthetic values or promote them, and not mess with them, to um, promote and enhance the, the, the life benefits aspects of the forest, how, how you have the trails to hike, spiritual sanctuary if you're walking out there, clean water. Um, people also noticed there was 82% of the respondents who believed if you were going to do an activity out there in the woods, you would be interested in it if it enhanced this, these two forests' ability to mitigate climate change and store carbon. Um, so it was sort of a theme of take care of it, keep it functioning as well as it is right now. They are healthy, resilient forests now, their condition is that. And one that jumped out on every response was recreation. You may want to maintain trails, develop new trails, all kinds of recreation, all seasons of the year and the whole family. A lot of people said walking dogs. So that that was our summary of those questions. And we're ready to move on. And so the goals, when I think of writing a stewardship, a forest stewardship management plan, I connect with the owner and I listen to them. I try to just listen. Usually we walk in the woods and people tell me what they like, what they think they'd like to do. So you have your goals and then objectives are moving towards the goals. And again, your whole community, ecological objectives, social objectives. The forest is there to give you, um, to function well as a forest ecosystem and provide you with all those free benefits. It just does every day, clean water, clean air, habitat. Um, the social objectives that you can recreate there and enjoy it, enjoy your leisure time on your community forest. And those two were of equal importance in the survey and the least important um, objective that your community feels would be 
useful in a forced stewardship plan was economic gain. Um, you're not really interested, it's not a priority to go in and use sustainable forestry practices to make money on your community forest. You might be interested in using a practice if it's going to support the ecological and the social values that you derive from your, com your community forest. That was very apparent in the survey and we have heard you. So we could go to the next slide. Oh, and we had some climate change questions in there just to create an awareness of are you, are you, do you understand what's going on out there in the world? And everyone, all the responses were overwhelmingly yes. That in some people stated what they have witnessed as manifestations of the change in our climate. Um, they were changing in songbird habits, changes in songbird habits, the invasive plants that are coming, the severity of our weather. When we have storm events, they're high velocity storm events. Um, the tornado was mentioned. And it was also, we derived from your survey that if you were going to do activities in these community forests, you would be interested in them only or it, if for a great bias towards if they were going to increase the forest ecosystem's resilience to the coming crisis that's looming out there. So that, those, that was the summary of that set of questions. And then we asked about what do you feel threatens the forest? And I found that your community as a whole is, cares a lot and is well educated about what's going on in the forest ecosystem and in the world at large. You listed things like invasive pests, the hemlock adelgid, the invasive plants. Logging came up quite often. Unsustainable forest management overcutting came up. There was a few respondents who said tree huggers, they felt were a threat. I use that image to address that response, but also the climate. Um, people were concerned about the damage that off-road motorized vehicles are doing up through the woods. I didn't know any at Fournier, but I have seen it up on Old Town Farm. Fragmentation or the development, the loss of forest itself you feel is a threat. Vandalism and dumping, people leaving their trash out there. Everyone responded as that they saw fire as a possible threat as the climate warms. And damage to your riparian zones. Um, degradation of water quality in the wetlands, the streams, the spring seeps, and the vernal pools. So you have a keen awareness of the threats that exist on your community forest. And um, we have to do our education piece. So next few slides, a little bit boring, but I'm trying to get across to you what a sustainable forestry practice is, is a tool that you can implement and go out and do on your woods in order to um, sustain its social, ecological, economic, if that was an objective, but it is not a high priority for you, and recreational values that are in your woods. So they're tools, sustainable forestry practices are tools that you use by conducting implementing activities within a forest landscape in order to achieve a goal. As we were noting on the slides, one sustainable forest practice, if you had a goal of um, promote and maintain the rich biodiversity that exists out there now, you might use a sustainable forestry practice of control the invasive plant levels. And um, what do they look like? Honestly, they look like the things that we have seen in the other slides. They look like trail development. Sustainable forestry practice could be making signage along your trails so that people know where they where the trails are or how to access your property. A lot of the response from the survey indicated people don't know up on Cricket Hill where your land is and what's up there. So if you use those tools of sustainable forest practice as well, you can achieve your goals. And what it would look like is one tool of civil culture, that's timber harvesting. Or it, one to one application of civil culture is timber harvesting. Another application of civil culture is invasive plant removal. But if done well, SFPs will leave your forest looking healthy and resilient, ready to take on the climate. That's what they are. So we can move on. We also try to bring a little bit of educational material about using the, the forest as a carbon sink. I mean, forests every day are doing their thing pulling CO2 out of the air. They need it to photosynthesize, they need it to live. They're doing us this great free service day in and day out. It's a field that your, your select board has expressed an interest in car, a carbon pool, creating a, 
a reserve for carbon pool on your community forest. It's a science that's still young. We don't know everything yet. There's basically two paths you can take. Just let it grow, let it mature, let it keep getting older. Those trees are going to sequester and store this carbon through their entire life cycle. Another approach is active management where you, you create a balance within this forest ecosystem of the accumulators, the young trees that are pulling it out of the air faster. And then you want, every tree is gonna pull, accumulate carbon its entire lifespan. So you want this balance of young trees, middle age and the mature trees that are just storing carbon on the site. So that, that's, um, you, people didn't know a lot about this. And again, we're all stumbling along on this. It's become really important. We need to use our forest in this way. And the scientists are still figuring it out. Uh, Mary, I'll, I'll just chime in for a second. I'm, we'll, on the town website, we'll also be posting up a number of different um, materials that are out there. Um, and one of them is co-published by Paul Catanzaro, who's at the University of Massachusetts, who's an awesome dude who I know some of you obviously know um, and interact with, but he and Tony D'Amato from the University of Vermont, who uh, uh, I really appreciate him, um, they put out a really cool publication about basically the carbon dynamics in forests and whether to manage for that or not is a, a management choice, but it's important to kind of think about it in the, the bigger context and they do a super job of, of pulling that all together. So we'll make sure that that's up there and available too. All right, thank you. Um, we tried to introduce in the survey a little bit of educational material about force resilience. Force resilience is the definitions there. You saw it in the survey. It's the forest capacity to take a hit, to withstand, respond, or, or resist disturbance, whether it's environmental, pests, pathogens, diseases, ice, whether it's a timber harvest, um, increasing temperature, and things that lower resilience is a force that is under stress from any of those disturbers that I just mentioned, or from low vigor, a forest that's not as healthy and vigorous as your two forests are, it's not, it's not as resilient. And you can increase forest resiliency by doing all of the things that support its basic biological function of providing habitat, pulling CO2 out of the air, um, regenerating itself so you might consider lowering the deer population or um, protecting some of the seedlings somehow with tubes or fencing, or making sure you protect your water resources. I think the, the science tells me that, what, 50% of the carbon that is stored in the woods is in the soil, so you wanna protect your soils. All of those are practices, or you could codify them as policies if you were to go in and do any kind of activities that will support and enhance your forest resilience, its ability to withstand the disturbances that the environment brings, that the climate's gonna crash down on it. So that's forest resilience. Okay, we're ready. Alf's gonna take back over. He's kind of the tech guy. Yeah, we'll see how this works. It's uh, so far so good. So thanks everybody for, questions before we start? for bearing with. Um, so um, the survey is, is great. Um, people generally do them you know, by themselves. And so our, our hope tonight is to encourage some conversation um, between people. Um, and so what I'm gonna do in a minute here is uh, hit the magic zoom button and we're gonna be broken into groups of about five people each because that's kind of how many people you can coherently talk with on zoom, I think. Um, at least that's my experience. Um, and we're gonna take, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 minutes and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll randomly end up with someone you know and someone you don't know and make a new friend and uh, talk about this, this topic here. And, and the main question is, you know, what specific measurable activities could Conway undertake on these forests in the next 10 years? You know, and that's just an arbitrary planning horizon. Um, you could say something that you wanna have happen for 100 years too, that's fine. Um, to, to enhance the things that you value there. Um, so, you know, activities here could be you know, mapping something out and quantifying it and putting it in some category, all the way up through, you know, 
dealing with some invasive plants or managing the forest or continuing or not continuing the work that's already been happening there. Um, trail development, you know, trail maintenance. Yep, so try to, try to think about those things. And um, it'd be great to create a list and then have somebody from each group uh, report back. So we'll have, we'll have four uh, groups of five people each because we have 20 people on the call. Um, and I'll jump between the different groups and help anybody who could need help. Um, but let's take a few minutes to, to talk about this topic. And when we come back, hopefully uh, each group will nominate uh, an intrepid leader who can, uh, who can speak to the group and report back some things. And Mary and I will be, uh, well, we're recording this, but we'll also be frantically scribbling notes and trying to, to get it all down because this is really, really valuable uh, to us as we try to craft something for your review and then eventual approval. Yeah, this, this makes our process work. We were charged with writing these four storage management plans. We look at the forest one way. We don't live in town. They're not our treasures. They are treasures. But if you could tell us where you want, what your vision is and how you might get there, that's what this work, the breakout session is all about. You need to guide us to complete this project. Thanks. All right, so here we go into the void. So hopefully this will work. Do we get put in a group too? And activities to encourage people who don't usually use these trails and don't go here uh, to come here instead of be instead of getting in their car and driving to Mount Sugarloaf or something. There's a lot of people who live nearby love their forests, you know, and use them a lot, and that's fabulous. But I think for other townspeople, you know, we're not going to make it super public to the whole world, but we want to encourage other folks. Uh, my third big priority is invasive plants because I'm seeing. Hi, Alex. Can you hear me? Alex? Alex is muted. Oh, yeah, now I'm here. I can hear you. Okay. Hi, Alex. We're um, trying to get Danny um, on board. It looks like her, uh, she's muted and we don't know how to communicate with her right now. Huh. We also have an iPhone that's muted. Let's see. Yeah, Marilyn doesn't, oh, no, Danny is not muted. Um, okay. So, uh huh. She might have gotten up away from her computer is my, maybe, you know, I don't know. And are you there, Marilyn? I am. Awesome. So yeah, I don't know, I don't know where Danny is. And the iPhone person didn't respond to me earlier when I asked, so maybe, okay. they'll, maybe they'll join. We don't know whether to start working. <laughs> I'd say let's get going. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and if there's any way for you to text Danny, like, or message through a chat thing or something, gotcha, that, that's well, what I was thinking. Yeah. I'll let her know. Because we, we we'd like her in our group. Um, all right. So the question, the question, um, if I paraphrase it, is you have specific measurable activities um that you'd like to see sort of happen in the next 10 years on either property or both properties is that yes. right alex yes that would be great okay joe yes do you have any ideas of things that you'd like to see accomplished on these properties um well as you know i was the selectman in 2008 although i think jack lockhead actually um, took the lead on doing the forest management plan with the two forests. Uh, I also have done a wildlife management on my own property, which is almost uh, <coughs> touching the, the corner property. Um, I, but I, my sense is from a town, and I'm going to put my old selectman's hat on, I guess, and my, and my planning board hat. Um, I, I think it's really trails is a big thing. I think maintaining safe trails, uh, maybe inventorying and identifying some of the beautiful spots. 
uh, along the trails would, would be useful. Um, would it be would it be helpful to have like a a sort of a, a documented trail maintenance program? I mean, I get the sense that you know Craig was saying how you know, the trail through the middle of the grammar school there is well maintained by the snowmobile folks. On the town farm, like, there's a couple trails that you can follow, but it's mostly because you're following where the deer and the moose are. Um, they're not really maintained trails. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, well, personally, I think a map um, of some sort, you know, or and a trail maintenance plan. <laughs> um, <coughs> I personally love those less maintained trails. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I do too. So yeah. it's just, you know, you just feel like, for me, I feel like on those trails, I'm walking in the woods in a different way. It's kind of like taking the back roads versus the highway. Totally. <laughs> and I would agree. I, I recently came across one and just like I'm totally in love. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, a, a different one, you know, I, I, I have my, so, yeah. I would agree. I, I, I don't like signs, um, but some people need signs um, to find their way around. Um, I guess I have a couple of concerns. Um, in both properties, um, there are some old culverts, old bridges, um, crossings that aren't stable um, and in high velocity rainfalls, uh, they tend to wash out. Um, they're not really a functioning stream ecosystem anymore. So that would be my concern. And, and they're in both properties. I think Alex, you saw how close that little stream came to an old farm road. Yep. And it's just the placement of the old farm roads. In some cases, we might not be able to do anything about that, but um, yeah, but there's at least one spot on the town farm road there, right, where Cricket Hill sort of turns into Johnny Bean Lane um, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a kind of failing culvert situation there that would be really good to, you know, people sure. do like open bottomed culverts that amphibians can pass through a little bit more easily than like a, a tube that's stuck up in the air that they have to, you know, potentially try to go through. Right. And I think that would achieve some of the resilience concerns. Um, you know, especially with Roaring Brook watershed being, you know, a drinking, drinking water watershed coming out of the Cricket Hill property, um, that we would want to improve some of those crossings, especially if people want to continue using them and if they should be used for forestry purposes as well. Um, anybody else? Well, I'm concerned about the invasives, but I'm also, I feel like it also depends on how those are taken care of, um, you know, because I would hate the removal to actually end up doing more damage because it's a lot of hardcore chemicals. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing, you know, I, I encounter this a lot with different clients of different sizes, and, you know, a nice thing that towns have access to is often uh, lots of eager volunteer labor, and I don't generally recommend the mechanical removal of invasive plants, but I think on both forests, you have the possibility to do that effectively um, because the populations are not very big and they're easy to find and you could actually do that. Um, so the trade-off there is significantly more labor, which is fine, um, and you know, I think it's totally doable on both places because things are not out of control right now at all. Right. So that's really cool. Right. So how about the education component on the Fournier lot? What do um, Joe and Marilyn, um, what do you think about getting the kids back? And everybody's back. It worked. Um, well, I had the pleasure of bouncing around between different rooms and troubleshooting a couple little things, but it was great to hear the discussion. Um, and I could overhear Mary in the other room and her discussion. Um, so I think, um, 
let's see if we can go uh, with someone who is in group number one. Uh, do we have a, a volunteer who'd like to unmute themselves and, and, and speak for the trees here? Who's group one? I think we're group one. Let's see. Alex, I, are we group one? I will. Uh, group one was uh, Allison, iPhone, Joe, Marilyn, and Danny. Okay. Since I'm unmuted already, I will uh, go ahead and try and communicate correctly what we discussed. Um, let's see. For but we we really spoke broadly about both properties. Um, and, and I think it was Joe said that he heard the people saying that trails were very important. Um, and that, you know, maybe we should, you know, of course, enhance trails and then maybe inventory or somehow document or guide people to beautiful spots. Um, there were two of us who preferred less maintained trails um, with very few signs and then um, then one person who did prefer a sign and had a concern about um, groups of people who might need the signs. So some kind of balance would have to be found there. Um, I suggested having a kiosk at a trailhead you know, with trail maps that you could take with you, or there might be a, you know, maybe a digital way to find your way around. That's a thing I just brought up now. Um, we discussed uh, failing culverts and uh, stream systems um, with old, these are mostly old farm roads um, where the forest grew back around. Uh, these old roads that are now used as trails um, for multiple uses. And I've witnessed uh, failures in um, these crossings um, due to high velocity rain events and the uses that are happening. And so it'd be good to replace the failing culverts um, or maybe even reroute a road if necessary. Uh, we had another person concerned about invasives and how they would be treated and if chemicals would be used that would be a concern um, and that maybe we could uh, you know do manual uh, control meaning pulling you know actually pulling plants if that was possible um, we discussed the possibility of educational opportunities behind the Conway Grammar School um, so that the kids could um, be more involved in their town forest that's right behind their school. Um, and I think that's about it. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, they <laughs> covered a lot of ground. I guess we did go a few minutes longer, but um, in breakout group number two, we had Craig, Janet, Mary McClintock, Priscilla, and Walter. Do one of you guys wanna jump in here? Okay, can, uh, Janet, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I went for a so volunteer to take note. We seem to, of the group that was there, there was uh, some, I would probably say a majority, leery of management activities. Um, uh, the one advocate for, or, or maybe two or three, pretty firm advocates for the forest will take care of itself, kind of do nothing. Um, I think in a nutshell on that, I, I, we're hoping that you will, you, you know, assess sort of parcel by parcel, section by section, um, the health of various do nothing sections or old growth, you know, if they're, if a lot of that is diseased ash and hemlock, then uh, you would make some recommendations on that for us. Um, I mean, I too love the idea of old growth, uh, but some of us are interested in a balance and making sure you have good methods to get, you know, other young trees coming up. Uh, uh, a couple of really good points. Mary, who lives very right next to one of the properties said, 
make sure who is ever operating the equipment is adequately supervised because you can have all these plans in place and then and then um, the operator maybe items were not properly flagged so that clearly is why we want to make sure you get that somehow in in yep. the final report um, there was some mixed uh, views on invasives um, I explained that in our with our own land now the forester recommends now you like treat invasives because um, before you create any addition any clearings my my feeling is that that based on what you said before in the survey you know we're not in this to make a lot of commercial money we just want recreational activity and healthy forests with a lot of carbon sequestration and, and a lot of um, variation for the natural um, the wild animals and plants that live there uh, unfortunately Walter one of our sharpest most long-standing citizens got cut off at the end and he was going to make a, an important point about economic impact or 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 not and uh we missed that maybe we can take it if we have a minute definitely okay. let's uh let's get through the other two groups okay. and then we'll circle back and i'll make okay. a note that we have that and i'm i'm All sorry right. i cut people off <laughs> um cool thank you janet um breakout group number three was uh grace mary matt and megan um do one of you guys want to take the lead I can speak to, this is Megan Gump. Um, I think we had uh, two thoughts. One was just really thinking about making sure that any sort of uh, forestry project or projects that happen are um, respectful of the land that's already there so it can continue to be used and doesn't become um, unusable. Also making sure that there is enough signage so that people know um, important landmarks and what um, treasures there are in the state forest. And then talking about trying to reclaim some of the roads that have um, old logging roads or old town roads that have since been washed out over the years or um, just sort of been overgrown and um, adding a little bit of trail maintenance to those so that um, the forest land is a little bit more accessible. Did I get it, folks? Yes, you did. Great. Oh, Mary, uh, you're, you're muted here. That says on mute. Um, one thing the group brought up was if in the future there is a um, silvicultural prescription, that it be done in a more conservative fashion that respects the, the trail system so that access is never really compromised once they put it goes away. I think that's important. So that, that's, the, that's it. Cool. And then uh, last but not least, number four, um, which was Beth, uh, Deb, uh, Elizabeth Porter, Potter, sorry, and Michelle. Hi. Yeah. So um, this is Beth. I'm hoping you can hear me. We can. Yeah. Okay, great. So I took the notes, so I guess I'll, I'll try to read my notes. Um, one point that got made early on in our discussion was, yes, we're interested in um, trails and trail maintenance and improvement and linking, possibly linking together of a, a more of a network of trails through Conway, but also to be, to be clear that um, we're not, uh, we weren't so interested in this as a, um, environmental tourism or recreational tourism from from people from out of the region that's not like something we're thinking of and towards that end seeing a fine line between you know increasing trails and signage and uh, mapping and maybe some improved parking areas but keeping them smaller um, then uh, just because um, Betsy Potter was pointing out that there's there's already you know, people camping in the woods and campfires places and trash and things like that and just trying to 
you know, walk that line. Um, we did name invasive plant management as a priority. Um, and then we touched on um, um, in the inventory that you're creating, we're looking for recommendations for specific areas that you would identify as needing certain kinds of um, possible civil culture or management for resilience of the forest. And the final thing we talked about was um, nice little tasteful plaques or signs that, it, that name, you know, very specific historical sites or very special ecosystems. That's it. I, I hope I didn't miss anything you, you all, the rest of you all, but that was pretty much it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, um, um, Walter, do you want to chime in? Is he back? Let's see if I can find him here. Here we go. Hey, Walter. Okay. Hi. Um, one point I was making is uh, to, I, I'd like to know how much um, leeway there is to do anything in the Fournier property because of the uh, designation of that area by natural heritage. Um, I know tornado cleanup was quite difficult for the snowmobile club there because of that. And I wonder Funny if, it, um, go ahead, Walter, finish your question. I, I'm almost finished. I was just going to say, is it a moot question? Can anything be done there? Um, I can address it somewhat. And we actually have present this evening, the district forester who was in charge when that operation happened, because when the harvest was done before, it had strict guidelines, restrictions on surface area that could actually be logged, and guidelines on um, temporaneous, temporaneous guidelines on the scheduling when the ground conditions were suitable to work around endangered and rare habitat, plant um, species habitat. And so, yes, you can do certain things. And I believe this is my understanding of the previous project is the areas that were accessible for silviculture were treated in the last harvest. And that's it. The rest was a restriction. And if Allison's still with us, maybe she can talk to that a little more. I'm still here. Uh, yes, it's, it's the way it operates is that um, the town utilizing their foresters would propose a project through a forest cutting plan and that would go to natural heritage for their review. Um, and so uh, about 10 years ago was when we implemented the new mole salamander um, habitat modifications and um, actually in Conway, um, that was the first place it was implemented in the state. Uh, it was very successful. Um, and so as Mary mentioned that um, around each vernal pool, there were limits to what you could do based on a measurement from that vernal pool. Um, and so it is possible, but each time you go in front of natural heritage, you could get a different response. And so um, there are ways to approach that in an economic fashion so that you don't do a lot of work ahead of time, I think, um, before you, you know, really get knee deep into a project and find out that you really can't do something. Um, I am aware of, of what is it, the um, nodding pagonia that's back there as well. So. Um, there were restrictions around what could be done near um, the known plant population as well. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Walter? Uh, pretty much answers it. I guess, I guess there, we don't have an answer is the answer. Um, <laughs> it depends on the program and the mood of natural heritage when they're well, approached. Who's working in the department when it comes up again? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, awesome. Well, we are coming down the home stretch here. Um, and Mary, maybe I'll turn it back over to you here um, to sort okay. of um, do a little, do a little are, summary. We just really want to thank you for showing up tonight. Thank you for your time with the survey during 
this really hard time out in the world. And your, your input is really what's going to drive the management plan. I took good notes. I think I have a sense of it. Trails are important. The maintenance of trails, um, perhaps improvement of trails. I heard that um, restabilizing surfaces that are eroding seems important to you. And of course, resilience. Yeah. Invasive plants are important. Um, so we, we're gathering this info. We plan another Zoom meeting in which we would present the ideas for activities that may be able to bring the forest into the vision that you've been articulating with your input thus far. We also plan to distribute some educational materials on the topics that were of interest. We might make that, or we're hoping to make them available through the town's website. We could give you links to really pertinent publications we find useful. Um, we don't have the, the second Zoom forum, maybe June 18th. We will send out another postcard, be more inclusive. I was informed it only went to part of the town. And you have my number, my email, feel free to contact us. Um, the plan completion dates still in effect through the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs is June 30th. And they're not seeming to be giving us an extension. It, it, made a, it might have made more sense if they did, but we we're doing the best we can with this tight window and we really appreciate you showing up and helping us. And when the, we will get a, the completed plan to you for review and then when the final is in. Our, our thinking is get it to select board and if you're willing to comment on it, we'll be willing to um, incorporate revisions in, in new ideas. So thanks so much for showing up. We do plan to linger a little bit, or at least I will. Alex has a bit of a crisis to tend to. In case you have any questions this evening, why, why we're available. So thank you. So do you have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Janet, uh, I, I asked it. If others, folks, I mean, it's on the survey. Uh, yeah. How much longer should we continue to encourage other people we know to complete the survey? That's when you might answer, Alex. Um, I just put it up in the... That first, that first draft with the writing. Yeah, I just put it up. Uh, we've had an amazing surge. When Mary and I were making this presentation over the weekend, we had like 50 comments. And then this evening we had 80. Um, so I think... Well, you, wait, you, you could have another surge if you give the folks a few more days. I mean, does it matter? Definitely, no, I think we should, uh, we should keep yeah. it up and um, the more the better. And what we'd like to do also is what we were considering and you know, this would be a good group to hear back, but you know, the first survey was quite time consuming for people to take. So we're thinking about also having a second survey that's very specific and much more just like, yes, no, like it, don't like it kinds of questions. Do you think that would be helpful? Yes, I did hear some grumbles that was a little too long and repetitive. Yes, we're trying to kill whatever, two, bird with, two right. birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. and yeah, we heard about it. But because we've got so many ideas, now we're starting to formulate the goals, formulate the objectives. And if we did a yes, no, then you could, then we know what to put in the plan. It'll be. Yeah, I think that would be good. So, so we'll give you a couple of days and you'll put up a new version and maybe we can encourage other folks to answer it. Okay, thank you. And thanks for your efforts thus far. Mary, I have a question. Yeah. I tried to put this in the chat. I put it in, but then I couldn't send it. But I'm wondering why you don't include proforestation in sustainable forestry practices. Um, that, that is a sustainable forestry practice. It's growing them out their biological age. I've done some research and I'm halfway through. There's a big paper out there. I'm only halfway through it. I apologize. But it is, um, and that, when I think of, pro, when I read, what I've read thus far is, I think of that as the passive management approach to using our forests to address climate change. And I think that it's a, a valuable opinion. Um, I didn't see, I understand your position, you stated it at the select board meeting, and I could kind of read, I think some of it, I think they were your comments or other people who think similar in the survey. And, but then there was other things in the survey. So 
I'm wondering if a compromise might be set up refugia within the forest, or I'm not really sure if it's within the scope of my mandate from this project to make that decision for long term for the community. I do value it. I see it as one possible way to use those forests to just let that carbon sit there until forever. So um, I'm just asking why it is, isn't presented as an option. I, several people have spoken about it. And so, um, Priscilla, I think, um, I think you know, there are, there are a whole list of things that are not presented here. Like, we also didn't talk about clear cutting, or we didn't talk about uh, planting things in the forest, and we didn't talk about mulching things in the forest, or you know, all sorts of different practices. So I don't, you know, as we begin to look at the different areas on these forests and, uh, you know, people made really nice comments in the survey about how on the one hand, these are very special areas. We want to protect them. We want to do things with them. On the other hand, they're, you know, it's 140 acres in thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of forest. So like, you know, some people were sort of like, well, what are we doing here? This doesn't really matter. Um, I think that the a really valuable part of these forests is that, you know, they're town owned, they're accessible to everybody, they're wonderful areas to demonstrate something like proforestation. From the survey, I would get the sense that, you know, people support that idea, but they don't want a uniform treatment of anything. Um, and so that goes both ways. And so, you know, I think we should include, you know, we can include that in the thinking and the planning, and that's sort of a, a one of the practices or one of the sort of you know buckets that you would begin to think about parts of these forests um but in a similar way like you know if you begin to think about you know putting one thing across the whole forests whether that be aggressively managing timber or proforestation or aggressive whatever you want to call it um you know i think those different practices need to be all kind of balanced here and i know we're talking about sort of science, philosophy, actual practices on the ground. And so we're not exactly comparing apples to apples, but um, we're also trying to strike a balance between what 80 different people think about something and it's pretty challenging. But right. could, we, could we consider to honor her voice, put it on that short form survey with maybe a sentence or two to, because you're, you're correct, we didn't explain it in our educational piece, um, but we could, could we maybe introduce it in survey two? Would that, would that satisfy what you're asking me, Priscilla? In part, but I think it it's also should be part of your pr presentation if you consider it to be a sustainable forestry practice. Okay. And not exclude it. Yeah. I the other thing that I think is important is that we, and this didn't get mentioned and I didn't get to mention it, but that we do look at everything in terms of what else is going on in context around us. That is, you know, the two state forests that may be uh, logged very soon, the more recent cutting, it, the Cowell's private land next to, you know, the, uh, the town forest and the proposed 25 acre clear cut for solar. So I think that wow. we also need to put everything in context. Okay. Definitely, and that, that's sort of, when I think about planning for stewardship, I, I refer to that as sort of the neighborhood approach. And that's thinking about what's within a reasonable kind of range, you know, where they're clear cutting things in Borneo right now, but that doesn't really affect what, you know, that's not really what we're here, but within a couple miles within the county, like that's kind of a reference frame that I like to think of as the neighborhood. And you're right, it's, it's super important to keep that context in mind. Like, you know, this beaver pond, there are not a lot of, you know, that's a pretty special place. Um, you know, the regenerating forest where the red pine was is actually pretty special right now. Um, the, that like unbelievable white pine stand across the beaver meadow, like that's pretty special. And like the old agricultural fields, you know, they're, they're slowly turning into hardwoods, which is what's going to happen over time. So I think you're right to say like that sort of neighborhood level analysis is really important. And that'll definitely be part of our mapping, our planning, and what we're thinking about. Because I'm Priscilla, no. I think to honor, um, Alex called it the neighborhood approach, when we write the, the forest stewardship 
form that the Commonwealth uh, recommends we use, they want you to talk about the landscape around this particular forest. And one way, if when I'm thinking about that woods and I'm thinking about how resilience likes young forest, patches of young forest, my thinking for both of your properties is you've got enough of that around these forests, so you might not make big new openings. So that's the way we incorporate that what's going on close by into our thinking process when you're completing the plan. Does that help you out at all or let, let you more understand how we're thinking? I'm not sure. Okay. When you, when you guys put up the information for the next survey and however you're gonna introduce it, can you, <laughs> tag in or put somewhere else on the Conway website because it seems like everybody here really cares about not just the town forest but also the state forest. I hope I'm echoing everybody. Can you tag in some of the stuff Mary that me and you talked about like open knowledge of the other stuff that's coming up and when the Zoom meeting for the other forests the uh, cutting is going on because I think everybody here would also care about that so it'd be nice to have one place like to the link because there i i'm not sure and allison might be able to help me i know when the when the state the management um program <laughs> state lands management program puts a harvest out they have public review i think they call it public review and it's publicized and how to get yourselves on that list i i can take the time to explore that and then be able to share that information with you Thank is you. that is that what you mean matt yeah that's what i'm saying i just feel like Everybody here also, if you if you go to the Conway State Forest, you're also going to the State Forest. You're also going to five other people's pieces mm -hmm. of land. So if we knew what's going on, at least in the State Forest side too, that maybe even make us change our decision what we do for our forest. So like the neighborhood situation, like if we can figure out what's going on in the whole area, it, now we have a nice place to put it and we all know <laughs> that it's a thing to go to, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can follow up with that to let you know. Right. Thank As you they, very they much. Do, do, um, I think they're doing them by Zoom now because of the current situation. They need, they need to send out postcards too. They need to send out some postcards. Thank you for the postcards, by the way. That was very nice. Awesome. Did you have another question, Priscilla, or comment? Yeah, I was just going to say those plans for the state forest were done years ago. Um, well, they do plans, but then they have a public review period or session that when a ago. project is upcoming right yeah i think that i i'm pretty sure i saw some coming up and they're going to do it through zoom the zoom platform yeah but they're not for the conway forest there are some there are some cuts planned for the conway state forest off of cricket hill right but those plans were written a number of years ago no this the is new work periods ended then it's there, there's there's new work, I believe, because I just saw the foresters out there. They may be looking at it and they may be looking to put it up. For yeah, them. I could totally give you that link because that is, that's a, like your responsibility. Just be aware of what's going on. And yeah, I agree. The landscape perspective is important in making decisions. So I agree with you. Any other questions? You've got us, so. Fire away. <laughs> well, and I, I put our uh, I put our email addresses there in the chat, and uh, please reach out. Like this yes, is Mary. this is what we're here for, and um, we're we're definitely operating on a on a tight time frame, but we're also pretty exclusively focused on this professionally. So it's really engaging and fun, and I this is this is why we signed up to be foresters, and we really like it. So please engage with what we want. Um, cool. Well, I think we'll stop there and just, again, like, thank you, everybody. Thank this you is, so much. Um, this is great. Um, Mary, the Mary McClintock, the, um, contact information is a little higher up in the, in the thread there. Um, and Mary's contact was on that postcard and it's on this, it's on the town website also. Um, and you can always just Google Longview Forest and find me that way too. Um, so, um, Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. And uh, yeah, thanks again for participating in something that we'd rather be doing out in the woods, but this went really well. So thank you. <laughs>